Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is your girl Mitzi, and this is Mitzi, let's think about it. Today, we are thinking about being a foster parent, you know, that's something that people really don't like to venture into, you know, that's kind of like a taboo in some people's eyes, just in that fostering system, you know, the people have a bad taste in their mouth. But luckily for me, I have a special guest on my show named DJ that is going to break those barriers and break those taboos and actually give us her personal experience with this, you know, taboo that we all think about in some way shape or form so let me fully introduce you dj why don't you go ahead and take it away <laughs> well thank you my name is dj stutz i'm actually the host of the podcast imperfect heroes insights into parenting i have been a foster mom and i adopted out of the foster care system our youngest daughter we got her when she was 12 and she is 27 now so um i have family members who have fostered and then adopted and friends, a lot of friends, because you wind up when you do fostering or when you adopt out of the foster system, it's a very different thing with when you're adopting a baby. Although there are some similarities and uh, we could talk about that later on if you want, but, um, but there's something that foster parents understand each other. And so when things go awry, no one's sitting there and judging you. They're just saying, yup. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. <laughs> so um, there we are. So the first little guy that I fostered was a little uh, boy and he was um, about, I don't know, not quite a year and a half. And when I got him, uh, I wasn't expecting to actually foster. It was just kind of thrown in on my lap. Um, we knew the, the birth mom's sister and they knew us and knew what kind of a family we were. And instead of having him go into regular foster, they wanted to do, a, it's like a family friend kinship kind of thing. So we actually got him um, before we were certified as a foster family. We were certifying as we had him. So that was kind of a very weird circumstance. And so, but we wound up getting certified and we had him and um, he's the cutest little thing. His birth mom didn't even know his right birthday. We had to get his birth certificate to get the right birthday. She was off and, um, she was a drug addict. And when we got her, she had been, um, arrested selling drugs. And this little guy was in a back bedroom, completely naked in a crib covered in feces and, uh, all of the gross stuff. So, uh, in Las Vegas, this was when we lived in Las Vegas, we lived there for 20 years and he, um, so they got him and Las Vegas has a shelter just for, for kids that oh, are going okay. through something like that. It's a special shelter. And so, uh, we wound up going, I wound up going to pick him up and they were apologizing. All we had were girl clothes, his size. We didn't have anything that fit him and I'm like, okay so I took him home in this little pink frilly outfit and uh went to the store bought some clothes for him and we had a lot of friends who were like oh let me give you my old stuff you know my kids outgrown this whatever so it's really important I think when you're even thinking about going into foster in assessing your your social circle who do you have as a foundation for you that you can go to that they are willing to help, they're willing to step in and maybe provide you with some things. Once you are certified as a foster parent, you can, you can have almost no notice. They can call and say, you know, we have a little guy. If you're willing to take them, him or maybe them, uh, we will be there in a half hour. And so you don't have a lot of notice. So it's really nice if you've got you know, a group of people that will be there for you. And in a lot of cities, there are support groups for foster parents. And so what I would do is even before I 
would even go, start the process, I would go to some of their uh, events and meetings and stuff. Though there, I've never heard of anyone that isn't open to someone who's thinking about fostering, but they're not a foster yet coming to their events. And you can ask a lot of questions and, and, and then you're already starting to build those relationships with people who will understand what you're going through and will help you be there, help you understand why do I have to do this or what steps am I missing to get certified, all of that stuff. They are more than happy to help you. They're a great group of people from my experience. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Anyway, this little guy wound up being my nephew. My sister adopted him. <laughs> There's a story behind that, but I won't. And uh, so then later I got a, a little girl and she was about 10, I guess. And here's another thing to think of too, is I'm little white mommy, right? And uh, I don't know if you can see, but my hair is very, very straight. Uh -huh. <laughs> Doesn't hold a curl much at all. This little girl was racially mixed. And I had no idea what to do with her hair, you know, and that's a big yeah. deal for these little girls. It is. And my next door neighbor, uh, we were really good friends and she was African-American. And so I took her over to my neighbor and I'm like, teach me. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And yeah. my, my friend had all boys. And so she was oh. thrilled <laughs> oh. <laughs> do the hair and do the little girl stuff. And, and so, uh, we were able to um, get some of that done. But if if you do get a child that is of a different race, racial background than you are, or sometimes they're even might maybe the same, but if I have like super thin straight hair, there are white blondes that have super thick curly hair. Yeah. Um, and and especially with girls, if you get a girl, you know, getting their hair, it's it's a big deal. And so it don't is. just try and push your way through, go ahead and talk to someone or go to a beauty salon that does hair for that, you know, a group. Yeah. And, and I have never found anything, but just, oh, I'm so glad you're asking. And, and the foster kid, well, and we're talking about girls specifically here. They feel so much better when their hair is done, right. They feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that I would suggest to you. Um, so you might be fostering and um, in some states, you have to have a special certification to foster newborns. And oh, okay. yeah, then, oh, yeah. And it varies from state to state. So you're gonna wanna check if you do want to foster newborns, you're gonna wanna check with your state and see what the requirements are because they're not the same from state to state. Okay, that makes sense. I have a couple questions though. With everything that you said, of two things really, um, sparked my my interest one is how long does the fostering process to get your license actually take and two um when you get a call saying that there's a potential for fostering does anybody actually ever say no and if they do say no do they get dinged by saying no um it depends on how often you're saying no and again okay. that's going to depend on the state that you're in but if you, like one time I got a call and they said, we've got this little boy and he was in the car, his mom was buying drugs, blah, blah, blah. Well, we were eight hours away from heading um, from Las Vegas to the ocean in Oregon, a little place called Gold Beach. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we were going on vacation and eight hours and that, you know. I mean, this was in the evening they called, we were going to leave at the butt crack of dawn, you know, to go. And I just had no way of getting everything ready that I would need to and go on vacation. And so I did say no, but that didn't um, stop me from getting other. Um, are they, are they a limit or is, are there, no, is there a limit for how many foster parents, I mean, like fostering children that someone can foster because it sounds like they kind of just rush it and kind of just like put you in like some some panel and if you're you're on the list and they call you and they go down the list and they just stick kids with as many people I mean how many how many like kids have you gotten all together like fostering not adopting wise I only fostered one at a time oh that was me. okay but it depends on 
how big your house is, what other children are in the house already, whether they're your DNA kids or other foster kids. Do you have the setup? Do you have a bed available for them? And so it just really depends on, you know, you can put some parameters in of what you are willing or not willing to take. You can okay. say no one over 16 or no one over 10. And sometimes they'll push that and they'll say, oh, well, we've got this little guy, he's five, but his brother or his sister, you know, is this age. And so they can um, try and push it that way. And they will often try to keep siblings together if they can. I've heard of groups of couples getting as many as six siblings at one time. Excuse me, I've got the hiccups a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, fine. Yeah. that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. And and they and they did it. Um, and the the family that I know, they took them on and they they didn't have any kids of their own. They weren't able to have kids. And so they were thrilled to have children in the home. And uh, we can talk a little bit about the adventures in a little bit that that occur with foster yeah. walking out of foster. Because how do they technically saying graduate out of foster? Do they just reach 18 and then get thrown yeah. into the world, basically? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. They or they just jump around people. from home to home until, I mean, because they're not they're not wanted or I mean how does I mean because I hear stories you know and I watch tv shows and maybe the tv shows and movies don't portray it to be as how reality is but it seems like when a host family the fostering family no longer is compatible with that child they just tell the state and the state just picks them up and send them to the next family and yeah. they just get jumped around from family to family does that, that sound right happen. my my daughter that we adopted so like I said, we got her when she was 12. Her um, birth mother had abandoned her at that children's shelter I was just telling you about in Las Vegas and said, I will kill myself if you make me keep her. And this was five days before her fifth birthday. So she was 12 years in foster care with 11 different placements and two other failed adoptions when we got her. So you do hear stories like that. My daughter's a living proof of that. Yeah. Um, and, but then you also hear, and, but it's not always, I don't ever want to say a, that a foster parent was, you know, selfish or cruel in, in having a child move on. So sometimes you'll get foster kids that will actually hurt uh, some of the other kids, whether they're foster or DNA kids you can get some foster kids that are just so disruptive um, yeah. that it really isn't compatible with mm -hmm. your family. And, um, and so I don't ever blame a foster parent for saying this was more than we bargained for, you know, maybe he or she needs to move on. Um, and my sweet little Noel, um, you know, did have some issues with uh, her life previous to being in fostered and then um, from every time that there was you know we, we need to move on um, there was another abandonment issue in her mind even though that may have been what was best for the family that she was with yeah I mean yeah. as a child in that in that predicament I could only assume all of the things that could be running in that child's mind it's kind of yeah. like it's sad you know it, it really saddens yeah. me you know how it just happens. I mean, it, I, because I have my own children, I feel like I can, I, I can never just abandon them and just leave them with someone else. For me, I feel like I, I, they're close to my heart, but that's different because I know mentally not everybody's made to be a parent, you know what right. I mean? And I think that's right. something that's not understood and not really talked about either. You know, this, mm -hmm. this facade of everybody needs to ha uh, have a kid and get married and have that typical picket fence life I mean it's not for everybody it's really not right. for everybody and I think um when you deal with difficult children do you just try to be patient with them you know try to see where they're coming from you know because I feel like that's the only real way to to do that yeah um and we did and and you have you have accessibility now to therapists to psychologists or psychiatrists um, doctors. So if you're, if you 
working with a foster child, you have access to Medicaid. Yeah, it's Medicaid. Um, and so they pay for, you know, from braces, although the doctors that tend to accept Medicaid are often not the best, yeah. you know, because they pay so low. Medicaid pays almost nothing for their mm -hmm. services. I So when we got Noel, uh, she had braces and the the orthodontist took them off and it was horrible. Her, I mean, it, it didn't work. When we moved up to uh, Colorado, so when, and I'm not sure what the age difference is. She was an older adoption. So her Medicaid would stay with her even though uh, we adopted her until she was 18. And so I took her into another orthodontist um, and said, what are you thinking here? And she says, this is horrible. This is a terrible job. You know, I'm embarrassed. And this was a really well-known, she had a big clientele. Yeah. And so she submitted and they denied her. They said, oh, she's already had braces, you know. And so then uh, I also saw the dentist. So it was the orthodontist and a dentist in the same office. So I was taking her in for a dental appointment six months later. And the dentist was like, I got to go get Dr. Lee. So she came in and looked, she goes, this is ridiculous. And so she applied again, took pictures, sent x-rays, and then they finally approved another round with braces. And this time it was with, you know, a really good doctor that knew what she was doing. And you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So it's really hard sometimes to get, even though they're on Medicaid and you have access to all of that, you really do need to talk to who they are seeing and, you know, without breaking patient confidentialities, you can get a feel for what kind of a person that is. And do they really care? Are they doing this because they're very kind, thoughtful people and, and they realize I'm making money over here. I want to do the best for this child, or is there something else going on? So, so we had trouble with therapists. We had trouble with psych with psychiatrists, you know, and all of that until we started moving her out of some of the Medicaid um, situations and, and getting her in with like our family doctor and our yeah. stuff. So you, you kind of have to really be aware. That's something to really think about as well is who are, who's going to see. So if you already have a family doctor for you and your DNA kids, you might have a conversation with them um, ahead of time and saying, we're thinking of fostering. Do you take Medicaid? Do you, you know, um, because a lot of times health insurances won't take a foster kid because they say, well, they've got Medicaid. You don't, you know, you can't put them on your family plan because they've got Medicaid. And so you just want to make sure that you're checking all of this out. And it, it does help if you have a lot of, you're never going to have all the answers because <laughs> something's going to come up and you're like, oh, never thought of that. <laughs> yeah. so, but get as many answers as you can. Like I said, going to a group where there is support for other foster parents before you foster is a great idea to get a lot of those questions answered um, for your state. Because again, a lot of the rules and regulations and how things move are different from state to state. Yeah, and that makes that makes perfect sense why it would be different for each state. And I totally understand the insurance industry. It's mm -hmm. it's it's a corrupt system, I swear. I, I hate it so much because it's so corrupted. The way that they have it is absolutely ridiculous. But yeah. that's not the well, topic of today. I've got cousins doctors and uh and I have a brother that's an orthodontist in Oregon. And you know, and they've talked about how you know, when they want to do things and the insurance, that, but this is what's best for the child, or this is what's best for the patient, you they know, yeah, they don't care. Yeah, so, they don't care. Yeah. Um, I guess my next question is, do you think there's a, there's a specific age group that's, that's mostly needed for adopting and fostering versus another? Because it seems like a lot of the times that people only want to foster and adopt newborns because mm -hmm. it's a fresh state, fresh slate, and they can really um, start like their foundation as mm -hmm. a newborn, like if they were adopting a puppy, you know? So do you think older ones are more so needed than teens versus the, the newborns? Well, and that's why Russ, my husband's Russ, 
that's why Russ and I did adopt a, an older child. So I had four kids and our youngest had just graduated from high school. And I mean, we were over the finish line, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, Way no, over. we went back for another race. <laughs> and, um, but our thinking was we're, you know, we're older, the little kids, they have, they get adopted easily. And um, the older kids don't. And we'd had experience, you know, with our foster, some of our foster kids. And um, so we decided to adopt, yeah, an older child. But, you know, even if you adopt a younger child that, even if you adopt them, like you're there for the birth and, and you're taking that child home, you know, I have a friend who did that. The mom was only 14 years old, the birth mom. And she knew this wasn't right to me. Uh, a person who gives a child up for adoption is nothing short of an absolute hero. You know, that's got to be a really tough decision to make, a hard thing to do. And yet you are giving this child an opportunity, you know, that you never would. Or even if it was an unwanted pregnancy, um, what a hero you are to take, you know, give this kid a chance. You don't have to be the mom. <laughs> but yeah. you can give this kid a chance. There are families who are literally waiting for years to get a child. And um, so anyway, you're going to get me off on another topic, but <laughs> I really appreciate and I admire women who are strong enough and loving and caring enough to give a child to a, a family that's settled and good. But even with that, they took this baby home and loved him and whatever. There were no drugs, no issues, but he still struggled in his like tween, teen years. Um, and then even as a four-year-old, he was throwing fits that were like none other. Uh, he would actually poop in his bedroom and rub the feces on the wall, you know, and that's with the newborn. So, you know, you can, it just depends on the kids that you get and what's going on with teenagers. You're definitely going to have um, trust issues, uh, probably attachment disorders. My Noelle has a reactive attachment disorder, although she's just doing so well right now. I'm so proud of her. Um, and she's married. She's got her own little boy and, and she's just got this great work ethic. She's working really hard and, and uh, contributing and, and taking care of the family. And so I'm just so proud of her. But boy, was it a road getting her there. So don't go in with the idea that, oh, it's all going to be roses. And, and oh, if I just love them enough, you know, if I'm there for them enough. And there are kids that if they've been through the system for any amount of time, um, they learn to take what they can get from anyone they can. And Thank so you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for being honest yeah. and being real about that because my sister, like I said, before we started the recording, she's, she's starting this process with a foster child mm -hmm. and she takes them on the weekends whenever she can. And um, he's a handful. He's 15 years mm -hmm. old. You know, mm -hmm. he's been in the system for a while and mm -hmm he's one that likes to run away and likes to claim suicide if he doesn't get his way and right. he's right. he's a handful and my sister she that's what she's going off of she says that she's doing this because she thinks that all he needs is some love and re and some dis and some guidance and someone to be there for him and and he, that's and then he'll be a better person and I'm just like it doesn't work like that yeah. it's like spraying water on a flower and expecting it to already grow like it doesn't it doesn't work like that but I think if you're going in in that mentality I mean I'm assuming that you're going to have a hard time actually facing the real facts of reality right yeah I think so um well no I don't think so I know so and <laughs> so now are there kids though who come in and they're like oh thank you so much for adopting me and I so appreciate you and I'm going to work hard to um, honor you and, and our name and whatever. Yeah, there are once in a while, <laughs> once in a while, you'll get a kid like that. But the majority of them are, they've, they've gone through trauma that we can, 
not even imagine. Yeah. We can't even fathom it. And so we, yeah. we can't expect them to process relationships and information in the same way that you or I would, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and here I was, I mean, I work for the, the Division of Family and Youth Services in, in Clark County, which is the Las Vegas area. For 16 of the 20 years, I worked part-time. I also taught school. And, and um, so I would um, think, okay, I've got it. I know. I was a parenting facilitator, for heaven's sakes, you know? And I worked with parents who were having struggles. And so I thought, yeah, we got it. We know what we're doing. And she taught us a lesson in humility. <laughs> oh, I believe it. I believe it. People don't realize that you're dealing with a human being. You know what I mean? You're not dealing with an animal. You're not dealing with a sofa. You're not dealing with something that's that doesn't have real emotions. You know what I mean? Like you're not dealing with a fish in a bowl. Like you're dealing with an actual human being that thinks in its own way, that perceives in its own way and acts in its own way way of thinking you know yeah. and I think people forget that they think that they could be like robots and they can just control them and mm -hmm. that's one of the biggest things that I I don't like is that they that people have that perception of other human beings like they're controllable like no we really are not that controllable we are very uncontrollable and we are very spontaneous like each human being is spontaneous and I think mm -hmm. once you're able to adapt and I think that's the biggest quality that you need to have when you're when you're being a foster parent is adaptability like are you adaptable and do you have that understanding of you don't know what what you're going to open in this box you know yeah. <laughs> I think that's the biggest thing but I guess to start wrapping up the show because it's going to cut us off soon oh. what would be some great advice that you can possibly give myself or you know that I can give my sister or any anybody that may be listening that may be thinking about this I know you've been already giving us some great great advice you know because it's really has got me thinking to the point where I need to sit my sister down and be like hey Let's really think about this. <laughs> well, what would, what would be your advice? Forward, you know, because it really does affect the whole family. When we adopted, it affected my adult kids who were out of the home. It affected my sister who lived close to me and, and who adopted my first foster child. And, you know, it affected everybody, our friends and our everything. And so I would say, be sure that we're being really open as we go through the process. And as you talk about it, you're going to notice the people who are kind of like, you know, or the people who are like, I want to be there for you. I want to, and you're going to start building that um, foundation so that you can be cared for. I mean, it's hard enough raising kids when they're your DNA, right? And yeah. you get exhausted and you think mama needs a break, you know? And, and so when the problems and the behaviors are so, so much bigger than the ones that you're used to seeing in, in your family. And um, you're going to, you still, you're going to need that break. You're going to need to be able to set back. I would make sure that you have a therapist for you and your spouse. <laughs> I would make sure that you have a therapist that's available for your children, your DNA kids. And then one that's available for your foster or adoptive child. And just realize that these kids come with their own, they've been solving problems for themselves their whole life. Yeah. They've been figuring out how to get food, how, how to find a place to sleep, how to, they've been figuring all of these out. My Noel remembers sleeping under a bench in a park, you know, and all yeah. of that. So her outlook. So just be, just realize that they come to you with very different experiences, very different attitudes and ideas about faith, about what family is, about drugs and alcohol and sex and education. Most of these kids, um, I will say, come with a very bad attitude about education. And you may have to realize that, you know, okay, how are we going to get this so that you will be able to be a contributing, self-sustaining, independent adult with what we have? And so yeah. I think basically find out where your child is emotionally, spiritually, um, um, socially, all of those things, quit worrying about the kid you want them to be. Look at who they are 
And then let's figure out what are the next steps and what is the direction they see that they want to go. And when they feel like they're not fighting you so much, you're still going to have problems. You're going to have problems with your DNA kid too. Yeah. Um, but no matter what, you're still going to have problems. But when they feel like you're on their side and that you're not trying to push them into a lifestyle that uh, just they feel like didn't or won't work for them, then, you know, it's a little better. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, DJ. Your yes. perspective is so breathtaking and so needed and so real that I feel like this conversation is going to most definitely empower someone, you know, even if it's just one single person, I know it's going to touch their heart and realize this is what I want to do because I'm capable of doing it. Or this is what I shouldn't do because you know what, maybe I can't handle it yet. Maybe I need to take a step back and reflect on who I am first to see if I can really do this, you know? And I think that if you're thinking about being a foster parent, I think you really need to take that into consideration you know, your family, your environment, your work, your everything, because you do that when you have your own child, then you should do that when you're bringing in a whole new child into, into the yeah. environment as well. I think everything, all the tips that you gave, everything was so real and honest. I'm so glad that you didn't cover code anything because you know what? My show is not about, about cover coding anything. It's about exposing the realness of what it is. And I think society cover coats this foster system too much, the adoption system too much, where people have this facade is either they are too scared to, to, to even put their toe into the water or they're, or they're too willing to, and then they get bombarded and they feel attacked and overwhelmed, you know? And yeah. I feel like there's an equal medium there that not a lot of people talk about and I think you found <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> you know I and, I, and quick, I, I just wanted to share um when Noelle was in her early 20s I said to her I am sorry I wasn't the parent you wanted and she looked at me and said yeah you were not the parent I wanted but you're the parent I needed oh that would have made me broke out in tears oh, oh my did. goodness so you know it took oh my goodness a long while it was it was a very difficult process but you know there she is oh that's a blessing i'm so glad i had this ha had was able to have this conversation with you and just to be able to meet you so that i can pick your mind because man you seem like a a pure soul you know Thank and i'm you. so glad that you that you were able to foster your home to other people and just give them that hope again, you know, give them that love again and give them that reassurance that not everybody's bad, you know, because that's the bad thing. You never know who you're going to deal with as a foster parent. They could be corrupt. They may look be perfect on paper, but in their mind, they could be horrible individuals. You know, that's mm -hmm. something that these children go into without even knowing either, you know, and it's a scary process for them as well. It's terrifying. But if you guys want to know more, or want to hear dj's podcast go check it out i have a link on my website with her beautiful photo so that oh. you can find out everything about dj <laughs> <laughs> and go check out and listen to her if you're wondering about some parenting tips I'm, i listen to her podcast and she has some great advice out there. Me being a new parent, I was listening. I was like, oh, let me write that down. <laughs> so, you know, you never know what, you, what you're going to find. But you, got, you guys take care now. Bye. Bye-bye.